Welcome to Home and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves, featuring conversations with special guests on topics related, but not limited to burnout, mindset, fulfillment, transitions, wellness, and so much more. I am your host, Jessica Locke, Astrala Yoga Guide and Holistic Wellness Coach. And this podcast is not about telling you what to do. I believe we all have the answers we need within. This podcast is here to inspire you, help you find clarity, and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. And of course, we'll be sharing tools and strategies from our guests to embrace your inner wisdom and live unleashed. Ready to dive in? Hello, hello, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me here today. And I'm so excited for today's conversation. And I probably say this in every single episode, but if I weren't, I wouldn't be sharing it. So yeah, I'm excited. I'm pumped. And also, I am realize, thanks to my sister's message, that this podcast just turned one. One year. Can you believe it? I, I can't believe it. I'm continuously pinching myself. I can't believe that. It's been one year since I dared to express myself, use my voice. A year that I've gotten to be inspired by so many amazing conversations, guests, and also comment and feedback from you all. It's been extraordinary. I am grateful about this every, every single day. And I don't want to turn this into like an appreciation episode, but I do, I do really appreciate every single person who listens to this, who's ever commented, messaged me about how much this podcast has inspired them, has invited them to look deeper and connect to themselves. There's nothing that brings me more joy and just appreciation so thank you thank you for this and now that we did our mini celebration i'm so excited to introduce our next guest today laura Yu. she's an rd she's also an anti-diet dietitian certified intuitive eating counselor strala yoga guide and owner of laura Yu nutrition a private practice in New York City where she helps people learn how to eat intuitively and live life with more balance and ease. Her mission is to help people ditch the diet and nourish a positive relationship with their mind, body, and food. She believes that true health is all-encompassing, physical, emotional, and mental well-being, not an external measure via shape or size. I met Laura a couple of years ago at Estrella Yoga Training in New York, and I've loved her content. I've been following since, and I learned so much about diet culture, what it means to kind of reestablish your connection to food. So I'm super, super excited for this. And in today's episode, Laura talks about how weight loss doesn't equal health, what is intuitive eating and its benefits, Reinventing our relationship to food and our bodies. What is diet culture and the subliminal marketing messages that get feed into that? Some of the effects that the pandemic had on food and diet culture. And how to invite curiosity into our journey and our relationship with food. And a lot more. Come join our chat. Hi, Laura. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Jess. Thank you so much for having me. And such an honor that you invited me on here. I'm really excited for our chat today. Yes, I know we're going to have such an, like, an amazing conversation because this is a topic that I'm sure has been part of our lives growing up or depending on how much mm-hmm. it takes in our like mental state. Like You are an, an anti-diet dietitian, certified intuitive eating counselor, and I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit more. So we're going to be talking about food and taking care of ourselves today. And, you know, how, how, how does that work? 
Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, so I am an anti-diet dietitian, a certified intuitive eating counselor, um, and I have a private practice in New York City, Laurie Nutrition. Um, and essentially, yeah, like what I usually help guide people on is how to make peace with food and heal their bodies and body image. And um, a lot of times when people come to me, it is what we call like diet rock bottom, where maybe they have had a really extensive history with chronic yo-yo dieting, uh, or they've been told all their life that like their body is wrong or something that needs to be fixed or that like weight loss is the answer. So a lot of like body trauma in many ways and essentially like helping them guide um, themselves back home in a way <laughs> um, and find like authentic health and figure out like what that means to them, what that looks like and how that feels. Mm, yeah, I don't think I've talked to anyone who's never had a complicated relationship with food yeah sometimes yeah. it's either and they're not aware of it I wasn't aware of the relationship I had with food or how certain foods will make me afraid of gaining weight or afraid of losing weight and like we attach so much weight to food itself <laughs> yeah like pun intended <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah it's so true and I think and I've reflected on it so much and that I think dieting is so normalized across cultures that and for centuries too like that it's so normalized that it's hard to tell when we're engaging in it when the information is being consumed or just even like unsolicited advice that happens in our daily interactions that it's so pervasive that it's like really sneaky in that way where it evolves um and it adapts and it's it's hard to tell um when that's happening but for the most part I would say like that dieting like kind of lives on a spectrum or like it can be very severe where it's very obvious um, and then it could be maybe more low key and there's just like, it just lives on a spectrum. But I would say for the most part, no one is immune to diet culture um, or even like being at the risk of dieting which can cause so a cascade of events in terms of like mental health and physical health which is uh, what I'm super, super passionate about being able to like bring all of those things together. Mm. So tell me a little bit about your journey to like the anti-diet dietitian. Like how does that, when people come to you, they're probably like, what? Do I do whatever I want here now? Right. Oh yeah. So interesting. And such a common question. I think that's a term that is maybe thrown around a lot, but then some people have never come across it at all. Um, and it just like in a nutshell means that I'm rejecting the notion that weight loss equates to health by any means, um, which is not the norm. We are taught from a very young age that si like the smaller the body, the more valuable, um, or that um, if we are diagnosed with some type of medical condition that weight loss is the answer. And you know, weight loss ends up being this like umbrella solution or recommendation for seemingly like everything under the sun like uh if you're tired oh do you need to lose weight oh like you're you're experiencing more GI distress or it could be from anything honestly I've had so many patients go into doctor offices or just for like a simple checkup and be told such harmful recommendations and this isn't by every provider but I think it's just I mean that's just an institutionalized weight stigma it could go like we could go so far back but even just on the surface level is that it's so common to be told uh, weight loss is going to be the answer. So usually when someone comes to me, um, they're looking for something different. They want to try something else because dieting has not worked. Um, and so I think that when something has become a pattern of like, okay, it doesn't work. then at some point it's, it's almost like inviting a pause and saying, okay, like at what point are we going to reflect and try to assess like, maybe our bodies are not the not what's wrong here maybe it's the diet that's wrong um and, and like an analogy that I often invite people think about to think about is kind of like something like Tylenol or medication like if you constantly have a headache and the Tylenol isn't working for you then it's not your fault it, maybe you gotta look at something else like maybe there are other avenues to explore and in that 
similar realm. It's like, okay, like what about looking at stress? What, what about your sleep? What about your stress management? Um, your access to medical care, healthcare. There's so much to think about in terms of health that isn't just a body shape or size or a number on the scale. Mm, yes. Uh, I love how you talked about that. It's a spectrum. And sometimes people might be aware of where they're at. They might not be. And the fact that it's not just about food and your weight, it's about your health. But health can also be muddy sometimes when in the grocery store, everything is either healthy, organic, or natural flavor, which is the biggest lie in advertising. And I, when I was in advertising, I was like, how can we say these things? Like, this is not, this is an illusion. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, marketing is another huge one too. I mean, it's <laughs> super tricky in that way um, because they're promoting something and it can, labels are even so arbitrary. They can decide like how much of something that they're going to recommend. Like a lot of times, like it just, someone looks at the label and thinks like, oh, that's how much I should be having, even though it's not necessarily recommending that that's the amount, but we kind of get it into our heads that like, that's the recommended amount. But even if we were to take like a toddler who's reading this label, um, <laughs> maybe they're this very advanced toddler is reading this. <laughs> But if maybe a caregiver is reading that and they're feeding their toddler, like that's not, that's not, that doesn't mean that's the, the recommended amount, the amount that they should or their body needs. You know, if it's an adult, like, does it mean the same two people just need two cookies? It might mean that their body needs more than that. Or maybe some days it's less than that if you're a little less hungry or not moving your body as much. So it does invite like a greater conversation and so much nuance in this too. And so that's part of the work I do is that when patients come to me, um, I invite them to kind of think about it like nutrition therapy in the sense that it's a very different space where they can bring in their experiences that they're having in real time, like maybe during the week where they're feeling extreme guilt around food, um, maybe pressure of just easing back into society and navigating food scenarios around family or friends, um, how they feel in their body. Uh, so a ton of a variety of things. And part of my job is helping them kind of separate, okay, like what's the science behind this? And then what's diet culture? Um, and then I'm unpacking that together. Oh, it's almost like rewiring them in a way. Yeah. Oh, I love that you said that rewiring. Yeah. Rewiring their neurons, especially if an incident happens and their brain is wired to go in one direction, like self-blame um, and self-hatred, um, rather than going that direction, which is familiar and might be safe for some people. And it leads to, oh, dieting is the answer. We're, we're trying to create a new pathway here where they can see another way and practice compassion and curiosity. Mm. Curiosity as a major one over judgment. Yeah. Wow. And you know, in the past two years, especially with the pandemic, have you noticed an increase or people be more aware of the impact that they have from like staying at home and then going outside, not being able to, like you mentioned, like how do you integrate to society? Or I might be afraid of people seeing and judging me and, you know, all those narratives that usually live in our head, but then enhanced by the pandemic. Absolutely, yeah. That is probably a topic of conversation, if not in every session that I've had. <laughs> um, it's just a shared, a shared experience by many, even though it might feel really isolating to them. Um, because the, yeah, and that's interesting. It's so interesting how it feels so something can feel so isolating, and yet it's such a common experience. I call it kind of a like collective trauma in many ways because this isolation, living in isolation, maybe even feeling a taste of what it's like to just kind of be yourself. Um, and that, that might stem from like, oh, like I can wear the clothes that feel comfortable. I don't have to feel so much societal external pressure to look a certain way or dress a certain way. And then to kind of have part of that robbed in a sense, um, when they go back into the world, because they might feel like they're not going to be accepted or seen as 
successful. Like, so for a lot of the patients I work with, they quite six, they've been taught. It's not that they're choosing this, but they've been taught that success equates to how they look on the outside. And this part of this is there, that there is validity to this, like their feelings are real, but my, my work involves kind of getting them to <laughs> kind of see beyond that. Like, does that align with your values? Displacing so much importance on your external feel like that it's something that you want to live your life by. Mm -hmm. So it's less of me telling someone what to do or what to eat, but really inviting them to think about, um, I guess, being more authentic towards themselves. Yeah, and kind of rewriting their own narratives and mm -hmm. being more active in it, which can be terrifying. Yeah, yes, it is really... I will say terrifying for a lot of people because it does invite kind of questioning sometimes your relationships and sometimes your support and it kind of confronts things that are really challenging. But it, when you're able to be closer towards what feels authentic, um, it also brings forth greater connection towards, it like pulls the energy like towards you. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but if you're like, it's so, how exhausting is it to kind of act a certain way if that's not how you truly feel or to push yourself to a place of exhaustion if what you really want to do is rest instead of work out or if that's what your body actually needs um, or to try to eat less because you're trying to keep up uh, a, a facade that everything is perfect like there's so much that I see that is in alignment or parallels strala yoga and also intuitive eating I, my sense is that it is for you too because of the way that you're even wording things is so so similar yeah yeah and like you reminded me of like a it, it was this fitness influencer post that I see and you know now with social media we have access to information misinformation as well and sometimes mm -hmm you know, it, you really need to take it in and weigh it. And she was sharing how she got um, 23andMe, one of those DNA tests and say that her body is tend to gain weight easier. So she works out a lot more to compensate. And when I read that and I saw the comments, I like, I usually don't comment on these things because I just watch, but it was like, you can see that more people are aware of the narrative and they're like, well, why are you trying so hard? It's so much energy to be to go against your nature and then somewhere like you can change your nature but I think that's so interesting you know the example that you shared of like how much more energy how much more like energetic weight you're putting on yourself to be something you're not yes genetics yeah. such a it's not talked about enough but it's a big part of body diversity like it's real like we could all all of us, everyone in the whole world could probably move the same, same amount or same type of movement and eat the same foods and there would still be body diversity. Yeah, and just getting back to honoring that and letting go, of, again, the voices and the fears. How is the process usually? I guess everyone is different, but what is the first, first thing that, that clicks or the first myth that you bust for them in a way? <laughs> oh, the first myth. I should really, yes, it does depend on like what each person brings in. Yeah. I would say one of the first myths is that dieting works. That's a really tricky one. And there's like, that could even be a whole topic. Um, and there is nuance in that. And when I'm, when I'm saying diet, I'm really referring to like the intentional pursuit of weight loss. And to date, there is not a single study that shows that long, that dieting works for the long term, that it's like actually sustainable. So long term, I mean like more than two years. Um, definitely not something that exists that's like more than 10 years. Um, and the reason why I say that is because we, back to like kind of how we've been taught as a society that like weight loss equates to health. Um, people, my, my, belief is that people should be or ought to be focusing on behaviors and weight loss isn't a behavior it's not something that like you can actually focus on where 
it's an actual tangible thing like behaviors as in sleep behaviors and like what can you add what can you what else could you be doing what's joyful movement look like to you like those are actual things where even if the scale doesn't tip it still means that like you're taking care of yourself so we're essentially starting from a place of like what does health mean to each person and kind of rewriting that narrative because usually when someone comes to me I'm probably one of the first people they've come across where they're hearing something totally different, um, that it's not about weight loss. Yeah, and that diets don't actually work. Usually like someone is typically recommending a diet of some sort. So that's really the first, that's even the first principle of intuitive eating too, is like reject the diet mentality. Mm, yes, can you talk a little bit more about what is intuitive eating? Oh, yes, 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 definitely for anybody listening. That would be super helpful, I'm sure. Um, intuitive eating is essentially a framework um, and it is comprised of 10 principles. It's not a diet, so it's not really, it's not at all about weight loss. In fact, like the whole premise of intuitive eating doesn't promise weight loss. I mean, weight loss could potentially happen and weight gain could happen or your body could stay the same. We don't really know what that looks like. And I don't know what somebody's body looks like or should look like when they're taking care of themselves. And so that's part of the challenge in this work is also cultivating trust um, that we don't know. Like I'm not promising someone that when they work with me, they're going to arrive at a certain place. Um, it's not really about that. So sometimes that can be really challenging for someone, but that is um, one of the major, really important things I think really to know about intuiting is that it's not a diet. Um, the example, the prime example I have of an intuitive eater is a, a baby or a toddler. So babies and toddlers, like when they're generally, like when they're hungry, they'll cry and when they're full, they'll stop. And as this baby and to or toddler kind of goes into the world, maybe they go into um, kindergarten and now there's a set of external rules of when you're going to eat, what you're going to eat. And then they move into middle school and now there's some societal pressure. There's more external forces telling them maybe how their body needs to look like in order to feel accepted. Uh, marketing and social media now. So now we're going like layers and layers here. And over time, someone kind of moves further and further from being an intuitive eater from where they were. Like everyone is very much capable and for the most part was born an intuitive eater. It's just, there's so much noise um, so intuitive eating is kind of teaching you to check in with your body again, to listen to when you're hungry, notice when you're full, respect your body, like kind of figure out the joy of moving your body without having to be so calculative, uh, like bringing you back to like your inner child in a sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know, again, there's so many layers to this. What about when emotional eating comes in? And mm -hmm. I know I love your approach because you're like, if you want to eat like a Reese peanut butter cup, eat it. There's no good or bad because I think there is a balance. And we talk about this a lot, allowing yourself to sometimes even indulge when you feel like you need it. But I guess, how do you carve the space to know, like, this is the best for me right now? I know I, I know I'm already full, but I really want junk food <laughs> as an example. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is also a really common question that comes up. And um, I'm sure that if, if you ask someone else, they might have a different response. And my personal take is that emotional eating is not necessarily a bad thing. Like we eat for emotions all of the time, whether we realize it or not. And we might eat for celebratory reasons tied to happiness. We might eat because it's a holiday and we're gathering and it's so nice to have people around us again. So we're eating for emotions all of the time. But for some reason, there's this like negative connotation when people eat because there are some not so positive, like maybe it's on the other side of the spectrum when there's not such positive emotions around. And so I would say that emotional eating is not entirely a negative thing, but if that is the only tool in someone's toolbox. So if they are only turning to that behavior when things are going the like downhill, then that requires more curiosity, 
to see like what else is going on here and what how can we add to that toolbox um, so that maybe it's not the only thing that they're turning to like we expand on the toolbox and we get curious like what's happening during that time are you not eating enough that the eating is a response to is a biological response to restriction are you eating because you are so tired that you've taken on so much um, to the point of like that's just the thing that's keeping you up Right. um are you eating yeah like in what ways are you utilizing food like are you actually hungry or are you stressed like what is going on here and <laughs> if if you can figure out what that thing is how can we practice responding to that need so if you're tired what about rest if you are stressed how can you practice boundary setting so it's almost like it is that rewiring like figuring out what you need and how can you tend to those needs Oh, I love it. We just saw like compassion and curiosity in action. <laughs> like, this is amazing. <laughs> and it, it's so gentle. It's not like no judgment. I'm like, this is bad. I shouldn't do this because I feel like those, those pressure points we like put on ourselves make us want it even more. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's very fascinating how the mind works like that. Like you tell, even for a child, like you tell your like a child you can't have something it's like we want it more for some reason there's like this hyper fixation on it yeah yes yes. because I I remember during I don't know if I'm saying it properly in English right before Easter there's Lent I don't know how to pronounce that word oh Lent were you (laughs) Lent you Lent that's yeah Lent. (laughs) Lent and like at school they were like choose one thing you want to give up and I said sugar because I love sugar and I wanted it so much more every single day even though I in the normal I wouldn't be thinking about it as much but because I restricted it it's almost like my body was like excuse me what are you doing and then I'm like I want it's like I was an addict that week I'm like I can't believe I'm like going with no sugar yeah oh that is I'm so glad you mentioned that example that is so common I think it has a lot to do with body trust um a few things body trust because when that's the exact cycle of dieting actually but that's just like a a very helpful analogy i think to get someone started to think about the diet cycle like how that can happen like restriction usually comes first like we tell ourselves oh like no carbs no dairy no gluten all the delicious things (laughs) no sugar (laughs) right like exactly and then there's a hyper fixation and usually that's followed by um, typically a binge. Um, and so like that vicious cycle that continues to happen and continues to happen when it, when someone is dieting. And that's actually one of the first things that I talk about with patients too, is like, um, dieting impedes habituation from happening. Are you familiar with habituation? Can I talk about it? Is that okay? Okay. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So (laughs) habituation is, um, it's like a psychology term and it's essentially like when one is exposed to something over and over they kind of get not not necessarily immune to it but the threshold of excitement gets lower so a non-food analogy i would have is like maybe a couple and they've been dating for some time and they say those three words i love you and it's like the most exciting thing ever and maybe it's like 10 years down the line and they still say it, but it's not like, oh my goodness, <laughs> anymore. Right. It's habituation happened. Like they were exposed to it over and over. And so when someone's exposed to, when they allow certain foods to be in their home, so say like carbohydrates, maybe they allow the forbidden foods slowly to enter their refrigerator and then their pantry, they allow themselves the opportunity to be around those foods and the excitement, the, the specialness of the food gets a little bit lower each time. And then they start to trust. The cool thing is to see them trust themselves around the food and like habituation around food sets in and they trust that, oh, I can be trusted around these foods. Like I've collected evidence with this food and this food to know that I can be around them and the binge isn't gonna happen. Are you ready to create space for ease and alignment? I've created a free starter guide to help you go from frazzle to focus. It's a guide for the overwhelmed go-getter who's eager to find more ease, clarity, and alignment in their lives. 
so you can quiet the noise and strengthen your connection within. After all, we can't align what we don't know is misaligned. Simply grab your free copy at wholeandunleashed.com slash guide. Oh my gosh, you just like sparked a memory I had. As a kid, my mom would like, obviously she didn't want me to have too much sweet things and sugar. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, when I'm an adult and I live by myself, I will have soda and chocolate cake every single day. <laughs> that was like my dream. So I moved out and then a couple of weeks later, I'm like, I'm going to make chocolate cake. And I made it. I had it for dinner, breakfast lunch and then I was like oh my gosh what am I doing to my body I, I feel so gross and like it actually was like trusting that my body will know what it's best for it because after that I'm like yeah I will have a chocolate cake whenever I'm craving it but now I get like I was I was able to rewire like wanting chocolate cake and soda every day seemed like such a dream for a kid and then once I got to do that as an adult I was like yeah, my mom was right as much as I didn't want to admit it. <laughs> yeah, yes, that's exactly it. And you, like the power of you coming to that um, experience yourself is so much more empowering than if someone was to tell you, oh, like, don't do that. Or, oh, like you shouldn't. Because you got to experience it for yourself and see like, oh, how do I feel when I have this all of the time? Oh, I love this. Like you've given us so many like powerful insight and tools to work with already. Another question that I have is sometimes, as you've mentioned, like right now we're talking about diet in terms of weight loss, but there's also diet for medical reasons and other reasons. Mm -hmm. And that can also be hard to sustain, even though, you know, it's for your, your health. Yeah. <laughs> do you, like, do you get clients like this or like, oh, I, I can't have gluten because I, my stomach hurts, but I really want it. <laughs> do you help them yeah. also rewire that? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So it is a like balance between the medical component and also diet culture. Um, so I do work with patients who might have, might have usually both because they're intertwined in many ways, but for someone who is maybe like the gluten example that you gave me. And that's really common. There's like a gluten phobia nowadays where, right? Like stomach hurts, must use the gluten. Of course it's the gluten. <laughs> <laughs> and I would, I usually invite people to kind of think about, okay, if you experience this uncomfortable situation with this particular food, what about instead of omitting the entire food group, um, to kind of go off of more patterns. So if you have the same food um, multiple times, time and time again, and it's causing you to feel uncomfortable, uneasy, um, then that makes sense to maybe pause on it for a while. But what about experimenting with another way that it was prepared or a smaller amount? Sometimes people like don't really realize that they can play around with portions to see like what they tolerate, what's their threshold, or maybe it's a different brand or maybe it's a different kind of food in the same realm instead of just being so quick to go from one end of the pendulum to the other side of the pendulum, like moving away from this black and white thinking um, and trying to find the gray area for them. So it doesn't mean necessarily that people can't have any of, of, of a specific food. It might just be about finding what's going to work for your body and this is really individualized because what works for some person might not work for the other person and vice versa so it is a lot of going off of each person's own experience mm -hmm. I love this because it's so empowering and also it could be so overwhelming at first and an example I have as well last year all of a sudden I think the stress of the world shutting down and life I developed eczema and it was so bad that all the food that I could eat, I suddenly couldn't. Like my skin was not to be too gross. You're just awful. I wanted like to chop off my hand because it got to that point. And then I did an allergy test and I was allergic to life, like milk, oh um, anything with um, eggs, peas, Brussels sprouts. I don't know, all those things that you would never think of. And I was able to eat. And then I developed a fear of for food because I'm like, this could hurt me. But I know that it, it didn't. I know that right now my body was very reactive so that I couldn't tolerate those things. And I had to, again, once I started to introduce it, almost like talk to myself and recognize the fear there. And that's like a very like specific 
example, but I know that sometimes there is a fear of introducing foods that were once safe and then they weren't safe at that time. And then you think, you know, the association with it becomes mm -hmm. like, what I do? So like when I reintroduced dairy again, I was like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen to me? It's, is it going to happen again? And then like, you're fine, you're fine, deep breathing. And that helped me. But I guess my question is like the fears around food when they're being reintroduced, how would you help someone navigate that? Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. First off, that is such a distressing uh, experience that you had. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that definitely brings about that important question of how do you help someone, I guess, through the fear of inviting foods back. Um, and I, what I usually do is create a hierarchy with patients around their, what we would name as like maybe their fear foods or foods that they want to add back, but based on like level of anxiety. So maybe it's a low anxiety, like maybe from low anxiety foods to medium high and we start with like the low anxiety foods and we say okay like let's start with one and see how you're feeling because we're if we're adding all of them back all at once that can be the anxiety could be really really high we don't want to do that <laughs> we want to create safety in this too and so we might start with something like that like a small amount and also realizing that it, it also depends on the level of the allergy reaction like is it um, anaphylactic, or are we talking about like, you're just going to have some, it, it might be the flare up it might show up GI wise, like maybe picking a day where like, you're, you know, you're going to be safe at home. You might have access to the restroom. You might, you know, it's thinking about other things to make them feel like, okay, I can do this in, the, in a safer yeah. space. Um, and then sometimes also reminding the allergies are really tricky, but even reminding someone that like they once did tolerate these foods. Um, so it could be an adverse event happening right now that like now your body is just more in an inflammatory pro-inflammatory um, state where like anything you were eating might be going to be triggering or activating this response full body response and also taking I think it easier like, thinking about all the other components not just food because we could totally zoom in on the food but it's gonna be yeah. like whole body thinking about your whole body how can we lower stress overall because that itself is pro-inflammatory and not talked about enough and thinking about other ways that you can care for yourself mm, yes yes like this is everything's holistic and it's so mm -hmm. true even my natural path like what is stressing you I'm like I'm not stressed but clearly <laughs> I was so I, I, I was more like diligent with my meditating I needed to do it more often than I usually do and that really helped because like I think my nervous system along with my body because everything works together was like ah <laughs> that anything was like you could burst whatever bubble I was in so and then like starting to regulate that made me safer so that I could reintroduce like garlic because I couldn't even have garlic and like oh flavors I'm like where are all the flavors <laughs> <laughs> I know. like life right like where's the delicious life, yes. exactly <laughs> yeah Oh my gosh. And you know, you have an amazing Instagram account where you feature your dog, Cannoli. If anybody's watching the podcast, you can see a picture of him behind Laura. <laughs> and you also have some like amazing reflections kind of that call out to diet culture. And one of the most common ones I see is good food in quotation versus not so good. Can you talk a little bit about this? I know it's part of diet culture. Mm -hmm. yeah definitely so and are you like the are you thinking about specific is it a specific one you're thinking yeah, of? Just... I think it was the, the chocolate Reese one you know and then the healthier Justin is that the peanut butter or like yes yes <laughs> <laughs> so apropos that I'm clearly yeah. I do <laughs> love Reese yes <laughs> I wish I may get like a uh sponsorship with them or something <laughs> whoever's listening <laughs> Right, exactly. <laughs> um, yes, the notion of good food versus bad, like Congo, bad food, and that's part of diet culture. It's like a system of beliefs that might value um, certain foods as superior over some foods to be seen as inferior. And my, I mean, my belief is that like food isn't good or bad. Like food is food is food. And um, when someone because they're taught again it, or learns that 
certain foods are quote unquote bad or certain foods are quote unquote good. It's like when they then eat these foods, they also end up ingesting like the morality that they then labeled these foods. And then it might trickle into how they feel about themselves, how they choose to speak to themselves, how they might speak to others. Like there is like a domino effect that happens there. So kind of putting food on a neutral, in a neutral plane um, and rethinking, working on your language around food is super important and, and part of this work. Um, and I wouldn't argue with anybody, like if we're talking about maybe white rice and brown rice or white bread and whole wheat bread, like, yeah, sure. The whole wheat bread <laughs> and brown rice has maybe more fiber and maybe slightly higher protein, but that difference in the nutrition doesn't make a food bad um, or good. Like if we were to take the white rice, a bowl of white rice and add on veggies and maybe some protein on there. And we're looking at the brown rice, like this is the one that has more. But if we zoom into every single food, there's always going to be something that has more of than the other. Mm. And then we're just in this constant state of comparison and calculation and how exhausting that must be to kind of do all these like flips. It takes up so much real estate in someone's mind and kind of just doesn't leave much room for purpose or pleasure, like all the things that like bring meaning to life. And so that's why I see it as a much bigger thing than just like, oh, like maybe something else like that or good, but because it has this like trickle down effect. Mm, Yeah. And like tying in pleasure because how you're ingesting that food, like when you're enjoying the white rice versus eating something you don't enjoy as much, like that energy is different too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pleasure. And again, like it's more sustainable if you do enjoy something than forcing yourself, like what's the point of forcing yourself to eat something that you don't actually like? And oh my gosh, especially like with the cultural aspect too, like stripping that away um, for the sake of, you know, what someone else says is healthier or not healthier. Like that is really, really sad and actually really harmful and, and painful to have to kind of remove certain things that like bring actually greater connection to maybe someone's history or to their family or it's just so much more food is so much more than just what I think sometimes we see on the surface yeah yeah you also talk about like food diversity a lot which obviously (laughs) makes sense and can you talk about the importance of you know embracing the cultural foods and how might one go around it because there's also food privilege that people don't Mm -hmm. talk about a lot you know there is this like oh go eat all your vegetable organic and all that but it's not accessible and it's not cultural and again all these nuances that add on to it yeah with the cultural piece I mean I was personally taught in my training um, and all throughout school that I mean we never talked about Asian food like it was not it was never seen in a neutral light or a positive light it was never like oh okay like how can you help somebody who's Asian incorporate their foods it was always about like, oh, how can you take away their salt? Like, how can you mm. recommend like no sauces? Also, if you tell someone who's Asian, like no sauces, especially like someone who's <laughs> elder, it's like, they'll look at you like you are out of your mind, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> right. And so I think there was in the past, like my younger, much younger self, there was a lot of shame and shame in that. Like I didn't own the foods that I grew up with. Um, grew up eating and it wasn't something that I outrightly recommended or would say with firmness uh, and confidence that like, no, in fact, like our food is nutritious and it does, like it is aligned with health. You can keep these in there. Like, how can we focus on what else you can add instead of focusing so much on like, what can we take away? Um, And so, yeah, there, there's a lot there. And I think it's super important because I mean, we're, we're talking about diversity and inclusion and it's not inclusive if all we're talking about is like kale or organic like it's gotta be a life like there's vegetables that existed before kale yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? there's things that were healthy before they had the label healthy and organic and all of that into it yes exactly so 
uh, I think if we're going to talk about health, we can't we can't also not also address like the inequities and access and food deserts and um, all the other things that might make getting organic or certain vegetables like if we're not talking about all these other things then we're totally missing the point yes thank you for touching on that because yes it's important that your body is a vessel you want to nurture it as much as possible but sometimes it's not accessible and also knowing that your body is not going to lose nutrition from one jump junk meal as an example I think you put it so much more eloquently than I'm talking about it right now like it's not going to be what is our denutrition <laughs> please enlighten me <laughs> yes I think what you're saying is that you're so funny <laughs> that our bodies are really smart and like we it's very difficult to suddenly develop a deficiency in nutrition like a vitamin <laughs> yes <laughs> I knew I was good at taboo, like, yeah, <laughs> or charades, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's not dehydration, it's a denutrition. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. It's really, really hard. So not every single meal needs to have a vegetable in it or fruit in it. Like, you, you can if you want to and then you enjoy it, but it also isn't the end of the world if you don't have it. Um, and it would take weeks if not months to develop a deficiency and so I think that's something also to kind of think about and invite curiosity around it's trusting that your body is really smart and it is your friend it wants to support you wants to be there for you um and it can't do that necessarily it's really freaking hard to do that if all, you, all one is doing is like restricting because it doesn't, your body doesn't know that there might be food in the pantry or there's food across the street or in your refrigerator. It just thinks that there's a self-imposed famine that ha it's happening. And so it ends up almost working in a way of distrust because when it does, when you finally feed it, it might metabolize the food in a different way. It might hold on to the calories in a different way. I mean, we're really smart. Our bodies are really smart. So it is very uh, much wired for survival. So it could store your body fat in a different way because it really doesn't know or trust like when is the next time Laura is going to feed us. Uh, so we don't know. So let's just be safe anyway. Um, so that's also one of the very early uh, concepts that I work with with patients too is like, this is like, more than just superficial trust it's like really down to like a cellular level mm, yeah yeah because your body just wants to survive <laughs> and it needs mm. you to do it whatever consistency is different for everyone but it's going to adapt mm -hmm. yeah and when it comes to like access it's like someone's what someone might label as like a bad food might be someone's like only access to food. And then what does that mean that that person can never attain health? Um, and so if we're working from like a harm reduction standpoint and we're thinking about how can we do less harm in this world mm -hmm. where there's so much going on, it's like, what is the bigger picture here? Like what we, what we say, what we put out in the world really does matter. It's not so much like, yes, we might be well-intended. Of course, I really truly believe that everybody for the most part is out there like trying to do their best and to help people and sometimes even for myself like on this journey it requires like thinking back and kind of thinking okay like how how is what I might have said or put out there earlier in my work and, and probably even now too like how might that have caused harm and how can I rethink the way that I'm wording things about health and who am I addressing and am I thinking about all the other parts mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I can tell you even from our conversations that you are very mindful of it's not just food. <laughs> it is always the bigger picture. There's always so many nuances and it's all about holding space for them. And curiosity, I love it so much. Just how can you be curious instead of judgmental? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really cool. It's really cool to see that. And it's also so just rewarding to, I think, like walk with someone on their journey on this. Yeah. Oh. For someone who is interested in intuitive eating and they wanna tap into it, 
again, every case is very unique, but what are some ways they can get started? Mm -hmm. um, no, I think the one thing that someone can do is bring it back to themselves. Like, why do you want to do this? Because that, that why is gonna be really important. And that's gonna be the thing that maybe differentiates it from another diet is like, where is this coming from? Like, you know, kind of even thinking about like, how has dieting not worked for you in the past? Like maybe the first time it worked, but then over time, like what did that do to your body? How did that affect your social life, your relationships, your mental health? Kind of thinking about like, what is the cost of having gone on all these diets and getting clarity on that? Because that's gonna be way more powerful than if it's coming from, again, like another external force. Um, I think that's a solid place to start without even having to spend any money or even like buying a book or anything like that, but just even pausing and thinking about the why. So powerful. I know if anybody's journaling, they, can, they already had the journal prompts from your question. And how can people work with you if they want you to guide them along the way? Yeah, um, if they're interested in, if anyone's interested in working with me, they can always head over to my website, www.lauraru.com, and that's you spelled I U, and uh, or Instagram. Like Instagram is a great place for connection. Um, I'm at laura.iu, um, and feel free to DM me. I am always excited to, like, that's one of the best things probably about the internet is just that it can bring forth connection. And it's like how we were able to stay in touch too. And just a, it be a really nice place in that way. Yeah. Well, are you ready for some rapid fire questions? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no pressure though. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> What's the best compliment you've ever received? Uh, yes, the best compliment would be, this is going to sound so cheesy, Jess, <laughs> it sounds so cheesy. but it is honestly, when someone tells me like something like, thank you for, you know, guiding me through this journey or um, helping me realize that I don't need to go on another diet. It's something usually along those lines that really reminds me of like how rewarding this journey is. And it's such it's a, it's not that I don't think I did it. Like, I always think that it's just the fact that like, wow, like I got to witness this person, like come close, become closer to who they want, like who they feel like is truly authentically them and closer to their values. It's just something I never thought that like I could witness, but it's just, oh, gives me all the feels. Oh, I love it. A book that's changed your life. A book that's that was a that's a tough one. <laughs> that's a tough one. I know just one book. You can say yeah. a couple, whatever like comes on the top of your mind. Yeah, I'll say honestly, like in the last um, two years, one book that really changed my life about this work is called "Fearing the Black Body: The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia" by Sabrina Strings, and that brought on like a whole nother meaning to this work. Like I began to really see this work like for a more social justice oriented lens, whereas before it was maybe more surface. My younger years was more mm -hmm. surface level, and so it definitely brings another level of um, just energy to this work. What does coming home to yourself mean to you? It's a process for me that I'm like continuously checking back in with myself when things might feel hard or might feel, or might feel easy too. And making sure that like, <laughs> huh, like what does Laura think about this? Like, how do I feel when I do this? Like coming back to what feels important? What do I value? Hmm. what would you like more of time sometimes I wish I could like pause time and just <laughs> snuggle up with cannoli or spend time with my nephew and my nieces my sisters and just like I, I feel like that's really the one thing that I could use forever more of oh there used to be the show called Benjamin's clock or something where he, he would just pause the clock and he could stop time and I thought that was the most amazing thing ever I'm like I would read all the books that I have in my bookshelf <laughs> and have an odd touch I, like I would do so many things <laughs> that's 
such a good point <laughs> with reading books. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, through like maybe like a few pages, like, why did 45 minutes just go by? <laughs> exactly. I'm like, why am I reading the same thing over and over again? <laughs> yes, we need that pause. <laughs> yeah. One day, who knows of technology? <laughs> right. I know. It'll be super freaky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would be like, excuse me. Everybody's stopping time. So that time never moves forward. That is also a problem. <laughs> Next <Yeah>. podcast episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any advice for your younger self or just words? Oh. Oh, that's a really good one. It's a tough one. It would be, you know, I've been, okay, I'll say this because I've been reflecting on it a lot recently is um, like be present um, in the sense that like when I think back to my younger self, yeah, like I was always chasing like the next thing, like always the next goal. And then it was like, once I got that goal, I was like, oh, like what's the next goal? What's the next goal that I totally like missed just being in the present moment and like developing cultivating relationships and just doing things like I I miss I miss that that's the one thing that like I would tell my younger self and what I'm trying to like embody now that I move forward is like it's not just about arriving it's the process I'm there with you I'm there with you I I need to bring myself back because it's so easy to just like all the things we need to do next thing next thing and then Mm -hmm. I didn't enjoy my day. I was rushing. I didn't, you know, just breathe and admire the sunset or something like that. Yeah. That's so fascinating to me. Yeah. Just be more present. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for all your beautiful advice, all your (laughs) holding space for us to navigate, you know, what it means to connect to our own bodies and to trust and empowering us too, to really like, food is not good or bad (laughs) food can be your friend (laughs) yeah oh gosh that's a good one too and thank you so much it was so so fun talking to you Jess like I feel like I feel like (laughs) I just (laughs) could do this for like another hour honestly because it's just been so fun we can do an episode too (laughs) 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 part two yes maybe you're in New York (laughs) yes we'll do an in-person one We'll take any questions that people have. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much, Jess. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. What was your takeaway from today's conversation? Let me know in the comments or review. I would love to hear from you. Subscribe to get new episodes each week and visit wholeandunleashed.com for more information.